Hey all, here are OS Reviews. A while back, we did a review on an affordable Android tablet called the KingPad K10. I thought it performed pretty well for a device that was selling for roughly 200 bucks and came with an optional keyboard case that you could pick up and transform it into a two-in-one. Useful if you wanted to do a bit of typing. And now the company is back with their newest model, which is called the Z10. This version, though, is more of an entry-level variant, sells for 50 bucks less. That is roughly 120 20 bucks currently on sale. For the price, we're getting okay specs, but a bit reduced from the K10 to make the price more competitive. So this time around, it does come with a upgraded Android 11 operating system compared to Android 10, the same 6,000 milliamp hour capacity battery and 32 gigs of built-in storage, which is further expandable via a micro SD card slot. What has been downgraded, however, is now it comes with only two gigabytes of RAM compared to three gigs from before. That's why they've actually decided to use Android Go Edition on here. There's an 8 megapixel rear facing camera with an autofocus and LED flash and a 2 megapixel front facing lens for video chatting applications. Also notable is the screen resolution this time around is a HD plus so it's 1280 by 800 it's an IPS display but it's not quite full HD so another slight compromise to get the price point even lower. Really this is competing with other budget models like Amazon's Fire HD 10 which are all selling at around the same price range. Inside we have a wall charger along with a USB type C cable and there's also a quick start guide along with a tool for removing the micro SD card tray and a quick user manual. So taking a closer look at the design of the tablet, first impressions being that for a budget device it doesn't necessarily feel cheap. In fact they've retained mostly the same style from before, feels and looks quite modern when you're holding it. And in terms of the edges here we have stereo speakers in the base along with a relatively slim profile that contains a volume control as well as a power key on the left side, the type C port for charging, micro SD card slot along with a 3.5mm headphone jack on the top. Furthermore, back of the tablet is actually constructed out of aluminum alloy, so it's made out of metal, just like more expensive devices, so that it still feels quite cold and reassuring compared to the majority of other $100 Android tablets we've seen in the past, which are made almost entirely out of plastic, such as the aforementioned Amazon Fire HD 10. The camera lens, though, does slightly protrude from the back of the device, but it houses the aforementioned 8 megapixel camera lens along with the LED flash. Now, it is worth noting, however, that the frame of the tablet, to, including all of the edges here on the borders, is actually constructed out of polycarbonate plastic. So the metal component is just the back plate, but the edge here is made out of plastic that wraps around. And that is a slight difference compared to the previous KingPad K10, the one that's slightly more higher end, because this one here also has metal that is wrapping around the edges as well. But otherwise, in terms of the design language, you can see how it's super familiar compared to the previous generation, aside from the lack of that pogo contact on the base here since it doesn't support the keyboard dock. So it certainly doesn't feel cheap. Now in terms of the, again, operating system, you can see how it's very clean, but it is running on the aforementioned Android Go Edition included applications, such as Google Go Edition, Assistant Go Edition, Gallery Go are preloaded, which are going to take up less space uh, to install, and they have slightly less animations and a few reduced features compared to the full regular versions of their counterparts. So that is an area where they were trying to make things run and feel a bit more snappy on slightly more limited hardware. Um, otherwise, we still have access to the typical drag-up drawer for all of our list of applications, and again, it is very clean, aside from the standard Google Apps, Assistant, Chrome, FM Radio, uh, there's pretty much nothing else that you get preloaded, which is a great thing. There's no bloatware. We also get a handful of pre-included wallpapers, which are all pretty vibrant, and uh, these kind of show off the display a bit more, and overall you can see it's not a shabby quality screen by any means for this price range. Sure, having a full HD resolution would probably be even better. Since this is a larger screen, you can definitely make out some pixelation if you're squinting closely, but overall colors are still quite natural looking, and in terms of viewing angle, since it is an IPS display, you can see how it doesn't really wash out, still looks quite good, even if you tilt the screen at various angles, um, and brightness levels are also decent. In particular, the screen doesn't really have a gap between the glass and the actual LCD underneath, so it does feel 
again, pretty good in terms of uh, not having too much glare or reflections if you're pointing it at the light. When you're using the UI, it still overall feels responsive enough, but there might be a few drop frames occasionally, and you may have to wait a split second longer, as you can see there, for certain applications to open, but it never becomes too problematic. After a while, you'll get used to the experience, so it just takes a bit of acclimation at first if you're coming from a more expensive phone or device, but at the same time, again, it's not too crippling in terms of the experience. Good thing is, even though it's an Android Go Edition device, they have still given you the option to try out gesture navigation. If you don't want to see the virtual buttons at the bottom, you want a more full screen experience, you can actually minimize it and go through this more modern gesture based approach if you prefer. Now, even the search bar on the top here is really powered by Google Go Edition. So we'll let this load for a second. It does actually flip the orientation of the screen. So there is still a few parts where the optimization of the software might be a little bit better. Really, that's Google's issue at this moment, since the Go Edition app seemed to only be working in this portrait orientation since they were designed primarily for phones and now we're adopting it to a tablet but it doesn't seem to flip um, in this particular app but we are able to see things like search things as well as use the camera to translate things go into youtube directly and also swipe over to access uh, other web apps which are just going to load up in the browser here to save on space compared to installing the app equivalent from the Play Store, for example. And you'll also find the Discover tab if you swipe over to the left. That shows you some news feeds that you might be interested in. So instead of having this on the main home screen, it's actually inside of the Google app that you press on just to also save on data. There is a kind of a, a functionality there. So that works well enough aside from the orientation. Speaking of the camera, the quality of the 8 megapixel camera, I would say it's average. But again, really for any tablet in general, I don't really expect it to be outstanding but it does work in a pinch in terms of capturing maybe some documents you want to scan in. In terms of text, details still look pretty clear, as well as in outdoor conditions when there's sufficient lighting, it still looks decent as well if you're zooming in. And so overall, not bad for a tablet camera if you want to capture something in a pinch. It's not going to beat our smartphone cameras most likely, but it still is present. And now here's a demo of YouTube video playback. Let's try to crank up the volume and also hear what the speakers sound like. Stereo speakers are actually decent. I've heard much worse. It doesn't distort too much even at higher volumes and surprisingly has good clarity to it. So it's actually a pretty decent sounding pair of speakers built in if you're doing some quick video watching, whether it's YouTube or on Netflix, and it handles itself well. The Wi-Fi reception speed also seems to be quite decent, I'd say, thanks to the fact that they do have some plastic uh, wrapping around the edges and load at a reasonable speed, I'd say. You do have to wait for a split second at times, but overall colors do still look quite vibrant. So no real complaints there as far as for watching videos. You can see it can play back videos up to full HD, but the real resolution of the screen is around 720p. So anything really above that, you won't be getting too much benefit out of. So keeping it at around 720p will also save you on bandwidth and probably load things a little bit faster. So that would be the setting that I would advise sticking on, but overall not shabby when it comes to things still scrolling and uh, working without too much complaints. Now the keyboard, by the way, that they're using for search is also the standard G board. So we do have a pretty comfortable layout when it comes to typing. And you're also able to use swipe if you want to quickly type things out or use voice search. Closer look at the web browsing experience next. So let's tap on the page here. Again, it will take a split second longer compared to a you know, flagship grade device, but overall pages are still relatively quick to load, definitely acceptable. And you can see that it's doing actually a pretty good job considering The Verge is a fairly complex page and this is the full desktop version of the um, browser. So it does have lots of ads as well as videos and other elements, which will take a bit longer for everything to completely render. But scrolling here still feels relatively smooth, even though not everything has fully completely loaded yet, so we have to wait for a few seconds more. But again, pinch to zoom, everything still is functional. 
And so you can do a bit of multitasking. Again, two gigabytes of RAM is not the most in the world. Sometimes things do take a split second longer compared to faster devices, but it's still usable. And uh, in general though, you have to be a bit more conscious of how many applications you have open, closing out of things you aren't using to make the experience feel snappier. And when you are browsing exclusively, opening around say four tabs or so, it's uh, gonna handle it best. When you're jumping back and forth between them, things will still be left open in the RAM without reloading. If you're doing too much tabs past that number, it will start to encounter some more slowdowns and uh, may have to reload some pages. But overall, it's still usable for sure, and uh, we can see that the experience is not shabby, considering that this is a low-cost device. The 6,000 milliamp hour capacity battery, by the way, is definitely sufficient for lasting it through the day, if not often using about two or three days before I needed to recharge it again. So that's one area where having a slightly lower res screen is also more energy efficient, and it will be able to definitely get you by. And you can install virtually any application from the Play Store that you want to. Just be modest in terms of what you expect out of the performance side because of the more entry-level hardware of the processor and the RAM. Uh, but again, here's a quick demo of a more entry-level game. But after a split second, things will still open up. So for things that don't have as much demanding graphics, the loading times are still respectable. And we don't see too many dropped frames, actually, when you open up the game itself. Things are still performing pretty smoothly for most mid-tier and relatively simple titles and games. You can of course also download more complicated ones like PUBG or Asphalt games, but those will definitely be more taxing on the entry-level chipset and you may have to lower the graphic settings and expect more drop frames as long as taking longer for the game to open up. So I would still recommend sticking with more simpler titles if possible, but you still have a okay experience for some light gaming. So that is more or less it as far as our hands-on review of the Vasking Kingpad Z10. Again, their ultra-budget offering here in 2021. It's not without some compromises, including a slightly reduced processor as well as RAM, but still having a few highlights, including a very good construction quality for the price tag, as well as having okay performance to get you by when it comes to basic tasks like watching videos, doing some light web browsing and light gaming as well, and also good for things like reading documents, PDFs, eBooks. Uh, those would all be good applications on this particular machine. I also appreciate, as always, the expandable micro SD card slot, along with the Type-C port for charging, and the fact that you still have a standard headphone jack. So thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been our hands-on review of the Vasking KingPad Z10 budget Android tablet.